All right. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good. We, we are tuned in here. My name is Chris Carr. I'm with Black Land Ownership. We got the sweatshirts here. And uh, we're doing a new series called Just For My People, uh, the Black Land Ownership version. And I'm speaking with architects, lawyers, planners, activists, um, farmers, uh, developers, and trying to centralize information when it comes to land ownership, and specifically looking at how marginalized folks have been dispossessed or had difficulty gaining access. Um, and today we have two special guests. Would you like to introduce yourself, starting with uh, Diana? Sure. Thank you, Christoph. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Diana Norris. I'm a Virginia attorney. I currently work at the Land Trust Alliance. I'm the Associate Director of Conservation Defense, and I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you today. Thank you. And Chris? Sure. I'm Chris Pickler. Uh, I'm a, a South Carolina licensed attorney, and um, I uh, have just a, a, a passion for, uh, for some of the issues we'll be talking about today and appreciate your uh, you're having us here. Um, my day job is actually uh, as, uh, as a real estate attorney at Lowe's uh, companies, uh, Lowe's Home Improvement. Um, but uh, I am on the board of directors for the Land Trust Alliance, um, as well as incoming board of director for uh, the Center for Heirs Property Preservation in Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. Now in reverse order, so starting with Chris this time, can you give me a little background of yourself? like? Um, what your attachment to the land is and how that then became intertwined with the legal profession or your kind of community service work and how we got from as a youth to where you are now. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly Christoph. And, and, and again, thanks for this opportunity. It's, you know, it's a, it's a privilege um, to, to be here and to, to talk about this. Um, so I grew up um, in the rural Southeastern North Carolina and South Carolina uh, my dad at the time was in the textile industry, and so we moved around kind of textile farming town to, you know, to kind of small rural town, small rural town. But kind of the constant for me was that landscape that you see in the eastern Carolinas. Um, it was the tobacco fields. It was uh, down, down around the coast. It was the salt marsh, kind of all of that, just rural, uh, really undeveloped landscape for the most part. And um, I guess when I was growing up in the 80s, started seeing some of the coastal development um, that, that really uh, took off along our coastlines. And of course, as we know, that um, that, that impacts uh, heirs property owners um, and, and any rural landowners. Um, but that, that got me interested actually in environmental law. And so uh, through a series of, you know, undergrad, grad school, law school, kind of went down that path and, um, you know, but it, my interest actually kind of changed more, a little bit more into the real estate side uh, because the law firms I was with and, um, you know, it, but, but my, my interest in conservation was always there. And so that was the volunteer side of what I did outside of it. And, and I think, um, you know, that, that evolved uh, 2005 when I was practicing law in Charleston that's when the Center for Heirs Property started. And that's really when I became aware of this whole concept of, of, of Heirs Property and what it was and how it impacted um, you know, minority communities, uh, particularly black communities disproportionately. And that kind of planted a seed that, that I would come back to in my volunteering with conservation and with my work, because I think what, with, with dealing with real estate, um, you know, it tends to be a little, um, uh, it, it's not as personal um, because you're not really interacting with individuals, you're interacting with, with companies, you know, for example, or, 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 or whatever. And so I think as I started, you know, as I was sitting around in some of the conservation meetings, um, you know, I just, uh, little, little light bulbs started going off and discussions I, I was fortunate to have with folks um, kind of steered me. And, and, and I think it really just led me back to the heirs property work because that's so uh, fundamental to, um, the impact it has on individuals' lives, you know, families' lives who want to keep land in their family um, and, and not lose it uh, for development or other purposes, um, you know. So, so that's kind of, I, I guess, uh, you know, a nutshell, I can, I can certainly go a, a little bit more with it, but, um, but it's that love of the rural land. And, and what I would say just to that is when uh, Jenny Stevens, the uh, director of the center, invited me to join their board, um, we were having some discussions and she said, welcome home. 
And I think that was so powerful to me um, because that took me back to kind of the sense of community and all that I had growing up, um, particularly the town I was in, in the PD region of South Carolina was majority black. We had friends with, with people of all skin colors, you know, that was just the normal and, and I think in society moving around. You know, um, people people may bubble off in into their prof professional or other settings, and um, through I think more concerted effort in volunteering and all, um, you know, it became to feel more normal as to what community meant. And so when she said "Welcome home," um, that that pretty much said it all. You know, and um, and I think the Land Trust Alliance. I'm just so. Um, so excited of, of, uh, of it's, a, it, it's interest in this topic, you know, and, and we can certainly go, you know, more into that later. Um, but, but um, because I think, you know, it, it's an area of, of, of local land uh, conservation ownership that has um, historically maybe been overlooked. So with that, okay. I'll, uh, um, it's, it's refreshing to see, cause uh, you know, oftentimes people can can take on a rather cynical view of attorneys or even <laughs> whatever profession, and, and and not recognize that there's actual attachment. So I'm glad I have two people on here who are passionate about this. Um, Diana, can you give me a little bit of background of yourself and how you're tied sure. to this subject? No problem. Uh, sure. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, and after law school, I moved out to the countryside of Virginia where I went into a very small practice. We did every type of law possible in a small community and really tried to serve our clients. So I was working in trust and estates or real estate, uh, nonprofit law, a variety, obviously. I then moved into in-house counsel at a land trust called the Piedmont Environmental Council out in Warrington, Virginia. Uh, where they promote and advocate for land conservation and easements. And that's where um, I came across an article one day in my Virginia Bar magazine about Ayers property. And I really had no understanding about the complexity of that issue. And I started to educate myself on Ayers property. Um, and I thought, wait, this is such a really interesting intersect between property law and trust and estates and environmental justice and racial justice, so many things converging that I thought I need to know more. I need to really educate myself. So I reached out to the authors of the article um, and really the leads on the uh, subject in Virginia, the Black Family Land Trust. Um, and I said, how can I help? Um, and through a conversation, it just sort of developed and it ended up that legislation was being proposed in Virginia for the second time to address some of the issues with heirs property. And uh, through my legal work, I eventually was um, asked to serve on a work group to uh, have that legislation passed in Virginia. And I'm happy to say it was passed <laughs> last year yes. with a unanimous vote, which is pretty rare in the Virginia legislature. So, uh, but really it was due to the Black Family Land Trust um, and all its efforts to get that enacted. And so now I'm, I'm, as I mentioned, working at the Land Trust Alliance and Conservation Defense. And um, this is an area that we are trying to really explore um, our role as a land trust advocate um, to determine where we fall in this conversation. And I do want to mention that uh, the Land Trust Alliance is putting together a curriculum about public and private uh, land conservation, the history of public and private land conservation. And included in that curriculum has to be and will be uh, discussions about heirs property and constructive dispossession of land. Um, and so I really look forward. I am certainly not an expert. I am a student. I continue to learn about these issues, but it's really, um, as Chris mentioned, there's, there are sides of it that are academic, that are legal, but also a very, very personal layer. We're talking about people's homes and their histories. Um, and I'm just really excited to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, this topic is so vast. Um, when I first started trying to learn more about the history of land ownership in the United States and specifically looking at how that affected indigenous folks and people of African descent, one of my, my 
main obstacles was how to centralize information. There's stuff over here. Like if, if you um, are looking at not for, for profit organizations, they have certain goals, agendas and orientations. If I'm looking at like historical data, if I'm looking at legislation, if I'm looking at some of the political movements and ideas, and it is so overwhelming. Um, and so I can see how we, we'd all be students and that was just in me trying to understand how people were marginalized. I then started learning about heirs laws, partition sales, things that dispossess people. And I was like, oh, it's not just not being able to get it. It's we lose what we had. And, and so can you all maybe walk me through some of the definitions, some of the terms when it comes to heirs law or conservation um, vocabulary so that when we get into the real discussion, we have an awareness of what we're all talking about. Chris, you want to start off on a couple? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, you know, as, as just as we start this discussion, um, you know, it's uh, when we're talking about heirs property, you know, it's uh, helpful to, to, to maybe define that. You know, one of the things I, I found in, uh, in a couple of decades of working with land issues, whether it's been uh, kind of in a professional role of commercial real estate or um, or volunteering uh, with land conservation is, is that really very few uh, practitioners that I have um, interacted with have wh whose, whose livelihoods are, are, are land in some form or another actually have an awareness of heirs' property. So, you know, it's often called one of the, um, you know, the, <laughs> the, 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 the worst problem you've never heard of, um, in, in particularly uh, when, when talking about uh, uh, wealth and inequality um, in, in America. So heirs' property some, in, in some cases is also called fractionated land, um, depending on, on the circumstance. It's, um, it's land that has been passed down through generations without a will, um, and, and that has created, in essence, a shared ownership among all of the owners and descendants. And, and what that means, um, or, or it could actually be uh, that there's been a will, and in South Carolina, um, it, it would have to be, if it hasn't been probated in 10 years, which is just the kind of the technical side of it, but um, then it would become kind of considered heirs' property. So from a property law standpoint, it's, it's, it's a form of ownership that's a, as a tenant in common, which means if there are 10 owners, each, each owner has a, an undivided one-tenth interest in the whole tract. So if there's 40 acres, they each have a one-tenth ownership of the 40 acres. They don't own a specific tenth of the 40 acres, to, if that makes sense. And so, so the, the, the problem then uh, arises uh, where one of the 10, you know, may want to sell. Um, and, and that leads... Uh, often to family disputes, uh, among other things, that can result in court actions uh, where, where one would file uh, for what's called a partition. Um, and a court could compel uh, the others to pay the person for their interest, but the, the, unfortunately, a lot of the courts uh, have tended to just force a or compel a sale of the land. Um, and, and that can, of course, eject property owners who live on on the land um you know and we can talk more about the impacts of this because it's 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 a strategy of of people who want to acquire this type of land how they can they know that they can go after one of the heirs to be able to force a sale of the entire tract um, but those are some different issues and so i think it's just air it kind of heirs property and partition are two of the important concept as diana mentioned the uniform partition of heirs property act is important just in the discussion as that is being adopted. I believe it's up to 18 states now. South Carolina adopted it. Um, and unfortunately, um, fortunately, it's been adopted there, but um, it's, it's unfortunate that really the way it got pushed through was it was the, um, it, it was following the uh, Charleston shooting massacre a few years ago. And it was named, you know, the bill was really named after um one of the uh, the victims, and and so, you know, absent that incident, that tragedy, um, you know, you know, who, who knows if it would have passed as quickly as it did? But but we're thankful it did. It has not been adopted in North Carolina. It has in Virginia, as Diana mentioned. But so that's kind of heirs' property partition and uniform act. Diana, maybe um, talk a little bit then about land trust and 
conservation easements. Sure. Um, I just want to mention that the Center for uh, Air's Property Preservation, they frame this issue so nicely where there's um, an issue about the creation of Air's property, which uh, Chris just sort of uh, went through the legal terms about the creation. Then there's the resolution. So we're talking about possible legislation, reform, um, mediation between family members or uh, written agreements, okay? Um, but what the center does so nicely too is it takes it another step first, further. It goes, okay, well, if we have resolution, what is the sustainable use of the land going forward? How does that land remain in that family and in a sustainable fashion? And I love that third element of it. I think it's so smart. And I think that's where land trusts and the conservation movement really play an important part. Um, what we do is we work uh, with land trusts who are holders of conservation easements. Under law, an easement, a conservation easement, usually through state code, um, there are perpetual restrictions on land. And at first people are like, wait, 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 restricting my land? That sounds foreign to what I would want. Um, but the idea is that they are legal tools to preserve your land for the future, how you would want that land to be held in perpetuity. Um, and so it's the legal restrictions in the document that then is recorded and you have a holder of an easement, a land trust usually, or it can be a government agency. Um, and they enforce that easement. They come and they monitor it on an annual, usually an annual basis um, and ensure that those restrictions are being upheld. Um, some conservation easements also can be tax deductible. There's some great tax incentives, both on a federal and a state level. So it's ensuring that land is conserved in perpetuity. Um, and so that sustainable part, um, it, we see that role with land trusts working with family farms. Um, we see them with timber, sustainable types of timber. Uh, anyway, there's a variety of ways that land trusts can partner with families to ensure the sustainable use of that property going forward. Okay. Um, just so I also have a, an understanding in order to pass on or, or for someone to inherit land or for someone to give land, we have to establish ownership. And this is a part of property law, right? If, if I understand this correctly. And at a certain point, the government said, we're tired of people arguing over who owns what. There's gonna be a title and a deed or something like this. Again, I make art, so I'm not, I don't know about all this stuff, but there, there's- You're good, you're doing well. <laughs> There's an agreement or contract that says, we've identified this amount of space or land, we survey it, and we've said that one person is an owner and they're allowed to sell it to another. In order to prove that there's some document or there's some record kept somewhere. Um, one of the issues you have is apparently following the end or the abolition of slavery, that people received lands, but they were either illiterate or had no means of documenting that ownership of land or over time some of that documentation has been lost or people didn't even realize what they own. Is that correct? Can you tell me a little bit about this? You want to start, Chris? Yeah, certainly. No, you're, you're exactly right, Christoph. Um, so, you know, part of part of what we would say from our perspective is, is it's, you know, clearing title. And, and what I would, I would just take a, a, a step back and say, you know, in this space when we're talking about heirs property is, my experience has been kind of um, to build what, what I had mentioned earlier about the lack of information or knowledge that people have on heirs issues is, is that I think then that, that leads to a lot of people having blind spots about um, their understanding of how other people uh, use access and, and, um, uh, and own land. And so when we're talking about this tenancy in common, uh, you're, you're right, you know, the uh, Sherman's Field Order uh, 15 uh, in Georgia and, and the low country of South Carolina and Georgia, where, where it was mentioned, the 40 acres, um, you know, and then the establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau to, uh, to help shepherd through the uh, granting of that land to the um, freed, uh, formerly enslaved uh, people. 
you know, that, that immediately, if we want to go kind of in the, the history direction, it lost traction um, almost straight away. It, it never really took off, but there were enough um, African-Americans who were able to acquire land. And, you know, what you then see over the generations is, um, to your point, it's, it's how was the land uh, titled to begin with? And so one of, the, one of the barriers that we do have, and it's, I think it's, it's what makes this issue so, uh, in a way, complex, um, is, is that you, you look at each individual state and, and you have to look at their laws on, on you know, real estate and titling. And, and really, you know, what, what, what one of the things that, that is, is, a, is a goal um, for, for addressing uh, heirs' property, and, and it goes back to the resolution bucket um, kind of that uh, Diana had mentioned, is, is clearing title. And, and really what that means is, you know, as long as, so, so if, we, if we have a, a deceased person shown in the title records, and it doesn't matter if it's from 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, for the current owners of the land to be able to avail themselves of certain benefits that, that we all have uh, for, for those who are, are what's called fee simple owner. And, and that's what most people are who would seek to go out and get a mortgage to, to buy property or whatever. Um, you know, we, we take, I think, for granted that we can do that, whereas an heirs owner can't. So they have to go through this legal uh, process of, of clearing title first, which in, in involves getting with attorneys and, and oftentimes, um, you know, uh, looking through the family history, the family tree. So you get into a lot of issues there to try to then get the title and, and file the documents so that you can say that the current people who are residents and, and owners and users of that property are the ones who are legally the owners. And that, that matters for a variety of benefits, whether it's mortgage, whether it's insurance, whether it's disaster uh, relief assistance following uh, hurricanes. Um, you know, we see, we see that as an increasing issue that disproportionately affects um, uh, individuals who might have land, but not, you know, the, the clear title, for example. Um, and, and, and it's actually, that's one of the, the things I think that's, that's really, nice about the work that the, the center and other organizations in the uh, Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Program are doing is partnering with um, not just the, the, the forestry side to help uh, generate uh, kind of income and, and, and the economic benefit, but it's trying to stabilize that land um, so, so that the, the current owners can, can use it. And, um, and, 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 there, and then more easily pass it along to, you know, their heirs and others. Uh, but it, it, it's typically a, 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 a complicated process, uh, you know, and so it's, um, it, it's one that there's uh, certainly a lot of need from within the uh, legal community. Complicated and expensive, unfortunately, yes. quiet title. If you think about the generations of documents that you need to search through, unfortunately, quiet title actions are um, expensive. Uh, I just want to comment too on Chris's great explanation that um, there is some current incentives too. The timing is pretty uh, amazing right now because the Farm Bill of 2018 um, authorized the United States Department of Agriculture to um, provide funds and work with states that had adopted heirs property reforms through the Uniform Heirs Partition Act. Um, they're basically providing funds to work with heirs, property landowners to provide the access to the services that Chris has just mentioned. Um, and also to possibly provide funds to the states who have adopted the act to um, work with the landowners to quiet title as well. So it's a great opportunity. The details are still being worked out through the farm bill, but I did just want to mention that that is an amazing opportunity to work with heirs property owners. And those that do not have um, clear title, the USDA again is trying to work with those heirs property owners to figure out other agreements, non-traditional paperwork basically, could, that could allow those heirs um, to uh, access services. So if you had an individual where they 
received land where uh, almost like via verbal contract because uh, theoretically verbal contracts are binding, correct? They're just like almost impossible to prove or legitimize. Um, and so let's say there, there is this verbal contract of land or house being passed down and it is challenged and the people who challenge it are of African-American descent and go to court and there's a history of racism in that town or area. Is there a, a history of judgments going against folks that may have had legitimate claims due to literal lack of paperwork or literal um, lack of ability for them to fight for themselves? Diana, do you want to comment I'm, on I'm that? I'm trying or? to think if there's a case that I could bring up and refer to under this. I'll start with um, that in order to show ownership of property, you have to have the deed or you have to have the will that, um, and it has to be recorded. Unfortunately, under English, under traditional English common law, you have to have the will or the deed that's then recorded in the courthouse. Um, the oral contracts, the oral promises when it comes to real property and in, in succession of property. Um, if somebody has the deed, that's going to trump any type of oral contract. And, and, and I would add, you know, while, while not specific cases, I think you see, you know, in dealing with, with heirs property owners long enough, um, there constantly are going to be references to the family land and things like that. And, and it's just, you know, it's the, the land that the family uses and they've been told X, Y, Z through, through time, you know, and, um, but at the end of the day, as Diana says, you, you need an instrument. And that's really why that clearing of title is so uh, critical. Um, and really for organizations, uh, particularly, uh, um, you know, that are in the legal space that, that help uh, to, to help with those, those types of uh, clear title actions. And in addition, what we do see um, is a, an outside party, a non-family member, um, maybe approach one of the co-tenants, that, that joint ownership that we were talking about earlier, and maybe one of those co-tenants says, you know, I'm moving away, I need to pay off some debts, I, I wanna sell out, I don't wanna be part of the communal ownership anymore. That co-tenant can sell his or her proportionate share to that outside party. And that outside party might have an ultimate goal of acquiring the entire property. And under tenants in common, that outside party who is now a co-tenant because they bought that fractional share can go to the courthouse and force a partition suit, a partition sale of the entire property. And so uh, when we have the family with communal ownership working on that land, living on that land, and then to have an outside party be able to come in and buy a tiny portion of that property and then force the sale of the entire property, um, that's where we're also seeing uh, the issues arise. Okay. Um, in terms of then protecting land, you'd mentioned a land trust. What is a land trust? I, I came across it slightly when uh, we were looking at starting black land ownership and folks were like, yo, you should start a 501c3 or maybe if you want to lobby 501c4 or, and so I started looking up tax code, which you should never do. And <laughs> they're like 17 different ways you can end up as tax exempt, whether it's starting a social club, starting a land trust, uh, starting a 501c3. Can you explain what a land trust is for people? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. Um, sure, so earlier we were talking about conservation easements and the holder of a conservation easement, another entity that enforces the easement on the property. So a land trust tends to be a uh, nonprofit, a charitable organization, so tax code, um, that is set up to promote, protect, and enforce those conservation easements, okay? So it is an organization with conservation expertise um, under, but if it's a tax deductible easement, then there are very specific requirements of the land trust to appropriately monitor and enforce that easement. Um, and so that's determined by tax code 
Um, it's usually a corporation, a nonprofit, and then there are obviously some state code uh, requirements as well. Okay. And, and I just, I might add if I can, that I think uh, uh, the, the holding and, and, and stewarding of conservation easements is generally, I think, thought of as the predominant mission of a land trust. Um, but they can also, as a nonprofit, have in their mission being able to steward land and assist um, uh, others in, in uh, you know, community centered land, for example, um, you know, that's um, in the discussions a lot more these days, because I think it recognizes that, um, you know, again, going back to um, the discussion of a, t a, 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 a tenant or, or fee to actually place a conservation easement, for example, on heirs property land, um, you know, could be a, a bit of a, a, an endeavor because you actually have to, because it's a restriction that's placed against the title on the land, you have to have every owner agree to do it and sign off on it. And so, you know, it might be easy if it's two or four owners, but think about, you know, the typical heirs property scenario that may have, um, you know, and I'm not gonna say typical in terms of the number, but just the multiple owners, it could be uh, 12, 24, 36, 48. Um, I, I've heard through, through uh, friends of mine in the space, you know, that they've had properties that have had, you know, uh, 120 plus uh, heirs, you know, all of them have to agree to it. So, you know, the, 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 the deeper the history of the property and the more heirs there are, um, the more a conservation easement might not be able to be a, a primary focus as a tool for conservation of the land. That doesn't mean there isn't a role for land trusts in working with heirs owners to help steward and identify programs and, um, and, and others such as sustainable forestry and agricultural practices that can still yield economic benefit to those landowners and help them steward their land. They just may not have the title restricted uh, via a conservation easement. Okay, and to try to give a frame of reference um, for folks that don't know or do know, I think this kind of relates to this idea of if you buy land you have taxes on the land. There, there's always costs associated with the maintenance, the taxes, the upkeep. And so if you decide to purchase land that you can't live on and you don't wanna do anything with, you want to just conserve, you'll end up just losing money on it. So with some of these land trust programs, um, it establishes an opportunity to maybe get uh, government grants or to get funding to purposely not do anything with the land. I guess I'm, I'm trying to uh, root that like, if, if you look up and you're like, I'm gonna just go buy 50 acres in Vermont. You go do that, you pay a lot of money for that. And then every year you owe the state money on that land. And if you don't do anything with it, are you just paying out of pocket? Well, if you're a person like me, I can't afford to just give the state 10 or $15,000 every year with no income being generated. But if I don't wanna use the land, how do I generate income? Or how do I then cover those costs? Um, so are, are some of these easements programs that assist in this? Or can, can you give me a, a frame of reference there? So easements can, um, if they meet certain criteria, properties can qualify for tax deductions. Um, and those are determined by federal code as well. So it, you really have to look at each piece of property individually to understand its conservation values to determine if an easement would be appropriate, first of all, and if it would actually meet the federal code requirements. But in the scenario that you're proposing, if it's a specifically scenic piece of property, um, if there's specific habitat, and um, so the code goes through open space, habitat, agricultural, agricultural purposes are conservation values as well. So if you're actively farming the land, an easement is an amazing way to protect that land in perpetuity, but still allow production on that land. So I don't want you thinking that it just has to sit. Um, an easement allows people to have a productive um, economy with that piece of property, you just have to identify the appropriate conservation values on that property, have that reflected in the easement, and then enforce it to 
make sure that those values are protected in perpetuity. So the conversation, a lot of family farms find conservation easements as a tool to keep them running, to keep them going, because yes, it does reduce the taxes, but it allows them to continue the a livelihood that they love. Right, okay. And, and I would just add to that, I think, um, you know, one of the things you, you find in, in discussions, you know, with property law, for example, there's this concept uh, that, that's, uh, that's called the, the, there's a bundle of sticks that are, that are what we consider of as the rights you have inherent in a piece of land and in, in a property. In some instances, um, you know, if you unbundle those sticks of property rights, they can actually be more valuable unbundled than as as the as they are all together and, and where that comes into play is if you think of the bundle all together is that's the example of a fee owner of land that just wants to sell the land you know one time or or even or even rents it out for income um, when you start unbundling it though you can have um, you know say again if you have attractive land um, you can uh, lease some of it uh, to someone else to farm to produce income. Uh, you can engage in sustainable forestry practices and generate income off of a portion of it that way. Um, of course, here in the in the Southeast and particularly in, in the low country, um, you'll see Arizona's uh, leasing out or, or licensing out some of that to uh, for for hunting rights, for example, because that's still, you know, still done and practiced. Uh, but then increasingly, you know, here in uh, North Carolina and in, in, in South, both, uh, both Carolinas, and I'm sure uh, Virginia and elsewhere, you know, some of the discussions are you have uh, the current generation doesn't really want to remain in, 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 say, for example, farming. And so what do they do with it? And if they don't want to lease the land out to someone else to farm, you see uh, now a lot of that going to um, uh, solar uh, projects, you know, because they, they require a lot of land and generally you don't want to harvest all the trees, you know, to create a clearing to, to put out the solar array. So you see uh, those property owners. So there are multiple streams that you can set up. Um, and of course, as it relates to agriculture, the, 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 um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually has, um, has representatives in every county uh, of every state in the United States. <laughs> uh, it, it's one of the few agencies people don't realize how, how uh, far its, 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 uh, its reach is. And so the NRCS program it has can help property owners in, in that regard. And, um, and, and you, know, you have forest, uh, forest extension agents often through your land grant universities that can help. And, and I think that's a critical role, to be honest, that land trusts, uh, that, that lo local land trusts uh, can help uh, heirs property owners with. When, and, and I should say in this context, talking more about the rural heirs property because there's also urban heirs property. Right. Um, but rural heirs air property, um, because the land trusts are really plugged into the to the communities in terms of the the kind of the, the funding sources or grant sources, they're plugged into the natural resource agency professionals uh, that operate in those areas. They're plugged into generally the attorneys uh, who who are. Um, you know, doing uh, familiar with or doing some of that work and, and, you know, appraisers, things along those lines, because, you know, it's one of the things we've seen historically with heirs property is um, you might have um, someone come and offer uh, a certain amount for timberland for, you know, to, for the harvest of timber, for example. Um, but they know because it's an heirs owner that they can undercut the value, you know, and they might, I mean, you know, who knows what their motives are, but but I know that that you know if you go if you partner with with um, with folks like the land trusts uh, and and the local resource agencies, they can help guide you to the people who wouldn't um, perhaps try to undercut that and give you more fair market for for that. But again, those are there are a lot of programs, and so that's I just wanted to say that, but I also did want to distinguish that heirs property exists in urban areas, and that's the the issues with uh, townhomes, brownstones, row houses, with gentrification, with uh, tax sales, uh, things along those lines that, that you've seen. That's that's you know part certainly a, a, a valuable part of the discussion too. So uh, just to add on, there's a book written by Andre Perry, who uh, is a member of the Brookings Institute, called Know Your Price. I think his book deals mostly with uh, more urban environments, but he talks about how the appraisal uh, kind of structure has worked unfavorably against folks of African descent and how um, people need to know the value of their own property 
because you'll see them basically get short sold on it. Then the bank that buys it, you know, knows the actual value sells and makes immediate profit um, that should have been uh, generated for the initial owner. And when we think about land, you all might, I, you all do know a lot more about this than I do, but maybe this kind of also uh, relates in that you don't just own the land, their water rights, their mineral rights, their timber rights. Can you all, maybe Diana, can you discuss that a little bit? Sure, so um, if we're talking more about rural properties and the resources that are on your property um, come with the land basically. Uh, in the West, there are other complex laws about mineral rights um, and surface versus subsurface, which we don't need to get into today. But basically, the idea is the dirt you own um, comes with all the resources. Now, you can separate legally those sources from the land. Um, and Chris was talking about some of them earlier, whether they be a license or a lease, there's a variety of legal tools. But those are your assets wrapped into the value of that land. Um, and extracting those resources can be um, very profitable for some. Uh, there are ways to do it sustainably. And certainly, again, we talk as land trusts with landowners about sustainable, about sustainable ways to extract those resources or again, with conservation easements, um, the, some of those restrictions do prohibit certain types of resource extraction. They're valuable rights. As uh, Chris was talking about that bundle of rights, those resources are part of that bundle. Okay. okay. Um, in terms of what you all are working on, are either of you all excited about a current project or a certain endeavor or something you'd like to share with us? Somebody, yes. you be excited. <laughs> Go ahead, tell me, please. <laughs> I'm always excited about this work. Um, yeah. Well, as I mentioned uh, earlier about the curriculum that the Land Trust Alliance is putting together, um, you know, it's wonderful that I get paid to read and to learn more about uh, this issue. In fact, last night for this podcast, I thought, oh, well, I was going to just sort of look through some other resources and the USDA has a really interesting um, review on the black, what they call the black belt and heirs property issues, but it also brought in um, issues in Appalachia as well as some of the indigenous and Native American tribes uh, in the US and some of the, again, constructive dispossession with those uh, groups. And um, so in trying to accumulate some of this research uh, for the Land Trust Alliance and this uh, curriculum on the history of public and private land conservation, it just, every time I read something, it goes into a different direction or adds a layer or depth as we were talking about earlier. So I'm just super excited to be a part of even figuring out what the questions are, what are the guardrails, because it can just uh, become so not unwieldy, but so complex and so layered because we just are going back to the beginning um, of sort of traditions that I certainly grew up in and learning about, but now learning about sort of the benefits of communal land ownership rather than individual land ownership. And the um, assumptions I've made are really try, uh, somewhat being undone. And I like that process. And, uh, and Chris. Yeah, no, uh, so thanks. I, you know, I think in terms of, if I had to say a project, I think it's just, um, my journey in in learning more on these issues you know it, it's every time i read a book it, it sends me off to multiple other books you know it sends me down the the the, the path of, of history and in in learning history from primary and secondary sources the history i never really learned in this context and it can be very powerful um in terms of the project i think it's probably um, i'm i'm extremely um uh, well, I'm, I'm humbled to be able to serve on, on the, the Alliance's board, and um, I'm very humbled for the, my upcoming service with the, the Center for Heirs Properties board because that's, um, 
that's really bringing all, all of this together to help, um, you know, to, to help families, you know, and that's powerful. It's, you know, most of my legal career, I, I went a different direction. I, I didn't go criminal law, family law, things that dealt with people, you know, personal relationships. And yet I've, I've ended up going in a direction now where it's all about it. And it's how can I use my skills, talent, time to try to help people who historically have not had um, legal or political voices in any of this process. And so as I, as I told individuals a couple of years ago, you know, um, it, it's a, you know, I'm a student just like, just like, uh, you know, uh, y'all are. And, and, and as I learn more, what I've, what I've realized is learning, there's going to be a lifetime of learning of reading um, uh, and all that, but that can't stop one from doing and taking action. And so to me, um, the taking action now, the opportunity uh, that I can have to have these interactions with, with you and others and, and help just talk about here's property issues, get it out there. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited uh, that that uh, that that heirs property issues are being discussed um, on much more uh, much broader scale now than they than they have been because it's always been a bit of an esoteric concept because it's such a kind of a, a legal you know <laughs> it's a legal issue but if you go into the communities that 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 where where you have heirs owners I mean they know all about it from just their family side they don't know the legal nuances of it um, but so I, I just. You know, I'm, I'm excited to talk to anyone about it, you know, um, because I, I just think it's it's one of the biggest issues out there. People people think uh, a lot of these issues are issues of the past. Uh, the Pigford uh, uh, litigation um, here in North Carolina, that was a federal lawsuit was settled in 2010 with the you know, uh, black farmer against the United States Department of Agriculture. It's the largest civil rights settlement in U.S. history. And yet most people don't realize that land is is is, is actually not only the largest civil rights settlement in U.S. history, uh, but that it's as recent as 2010, and and there are issues that are still ongoing that need to be addressed. You know, um, so I think just to be whatever small role I can I can play, and and if I can help educate folks that are in legal corporate uh, conservation communities, um, you know, then 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 that's great. Do you think young folks are encouraged? as they're going through law school to enter uh, this field or arena, or are they kind of pushed in other uh, more prominent kind of sectors of law? And is there an opportunity for attorneys or lawyers to act as activists in this field? Ahead, okay, so certainly. Um, I, I think that's actually, you know, so whether younger ones are going in that direction or not, it's a great, it's a great point. And, and it's actually one of the reasons that I've realized um, at this point in my career, one of the other roles I need to have is, is, is to uh, try to help mentor, particularly first generation attorneys like myself, who don't come from a family of attorneys and have, have, a, have that background in their family. Um, because I think uh, those are generally steered to, to big cities, big firms. And, you know, the, the firms will in large part dictate a lot of what you do. Obviously, you have to have an interest in certain areas. But what we do find um, uh, historically is that uh, African-American attorneys um, who are entering into law school now are not going into kind of the wealth creation areas of law that one would think such as real estate tax, trust in estates, wills, you know, those types of areas at the uh, same rate, um, you know, as, as they might be choosing other areas. Um, so part of that is, is seeing faces in the community doing, doing that specific work. Um, as, as to opportunities for those, you know, I think um, there are a variety of, um, of programs uh, that, that center on wills uh, type, uh, uh, pro bono wills programs, which helps, that helps stem the, the, the growth and creation of, of heirs property. And so there are a lot of programs throughout uh, various areas, rural and urban, that have wills projects. And for example, the um, Center for Heirs Property does, but there, there, there are others through uh, legal aid um, groups and, and pro bono legal aid groups uh, for, for attorneys to be able to help, you know, in those areas. And, and that addresses one of the three aspects, which is maybe maybe cutting off the issue from growing more, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get to the 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 more challenging issue of the, of the clearing of the title, you know, and that's uh, that's something you know that that would be uh, great to see uh, folks getting more involved with too, if possible. I just think that's a it, it's a it's a challenging area, and I know from practitioners who have tried to do it, uh, you know, it's. Um, Outside of, I think, some of the nonprofit uh, models, it's hard to it, it's hard to do that. Okay. 
Okay. And I know here in Virginia, um, there is a project currently uh, being developed whereby um, when the reforms were enacted this past legislative session, um, it's a, the group of us said, okay, now what? We have the law, we have the reforms, but how does it help people on the ground? Yeah. And so basically the fam uh, Black Family Land Trust, again, got a group of attorneys together. They've opened it up through the local bar associations and I think the Virginia Bar Association as well to try and uh, have lawyers join in a pro bono to work on heirs property issues. Um, I think that the legal services, access to legal services and at times a mistrust or distrust warranted at times of the legal community has been a true impediment in heirs property. And so trying to address that, and as an attorney, that is one thing that I can work on. Um, and so in Virginia, again, they're trying to develop that project to make legal services accessible to owners of heirs property. Has there been a history of attorneys being aware of these imbalances and using it to their advantage to purchase land or get into development or, or not be advocates, but kind of contribute to this fractioning or, or issue. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's the showing up in a community saying, uh, we're, we're going to help you, you know, sign here to someone who hasn't had access to education, who can't read or write well and their um their adopted uh, signature is an x and so they they sign x you know on a deed you know and it and it conveys their right all of their rights and interest in land i mean that's that's you see that in primary and you, you see that in historical uh, sources uh certainly okay okay um yeah. for for folks that also aren't familiar what are some of the ways we mentioned a change in tax policy? We mentioned the fraction sale. We mentioned the uh, kind of issues around heirs property. Uh, what are ways that people lose their land? Like it, if I, I grew up kind of with this idea of you have land, it's yours. You have it forever. The people can't tell you anything. And now that we're looking into buying land, it's like, oh no, the government can tell you a whole lot about what you do on your land, how it functions, things change. Um, you know, there, there's, um, what is, oh, eminent domain. There are all these other elements to where the, it's not what I thought. So can yeah. you all give me a little information about that? So I, I would just say on the eminent domain action, that that's an interesting one because um, one of the things you see with uh, transportation and, and utilities um, is they actually don't have to worry about whether there's a clear title or not because they have the, by, by authority, uh, governmental authority, the ability to, to condemn the land. And so, um, you know, there certainly are areas of uh, communities that have been impacted by uh, transportation and, and utility related projects um, that, that have, if you talk to people in the communities, um, you know, it probably was heirs property. Um, but they know that they, because it's heirs property, it's also, um, you know, it goes to the valuation of it and, and what they have to pay out as uh, as, as the proceeds, um, because the ability to challenge it, it becomes a little a little more complicated with the number of owners involved. And so, you know, so so you know, look at some of the the in the last uh, you know so many years, roadworks and, and and utility expansions, and you know, uh, the chances are in certain areas you're going to see that it runs through heirs, what, what would have been deemed heirs property. Okay. Okay. Diana? Yeah, uh, condemnation and eminent domain are huge issues with large infrastructure projects. And um, I think we're starting to see much more press on how these routes for the large infrastructure are determined and what type of communities they are going through. Um, often large swaths of rural land that are not protected necessarily by conservation easements or other tools tend to be um, value lower of their fair market value. And so it will be less expensive for these large infrastructure projects to go through those areas. And as Chris said, 
um, those processes, those court actions for eminent domain are very specialized um, and uh, can, be, can be very quick too. Uh, you might get a letter one day saying um, that surveyors are coming onto your property tomorrow and under state law, under certain state law, you can't bar them from coming onto that property. Uh, and so it's a huge issue about these large infrastructure projects and how those routes are determined and where they're going. Wow. Um, how would people know this stuff? Like, it, like, <laughs> like how would any regular person that wants to have their you know, goat farm or, or grow their um, monk beans, how would, and protect themselves in, in these scenarios? So I, I think that that is part of the role that easements can play. Um, you know, one of the things we also see with Ayers property, um, I would say, is because it's a really a restriction um, on future use of the land, current and future use of the land, which could generally exclude certain types of development. When you're talking about um, certain families and individuals, you know, who may not have the income, um, they may not want to restrict that right, you know, for future generations or even for themselves, you know. Um, so if they could, if they could reach consensus on actually placing easements on there, whether they're agricultural uh, easements or, or conservation easements, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, clearing title goes a long way, setting up a family LLC or a family trust um, that that is more clear. But again, that's a process you have to go through with attorneys, but that at least gets it under a single ownership and that then the family members can have interest in that ownership and you can set up the governance of that differently. Um, but that at least makes it a little more clear, you know, on the on clearing up of the title and goes to some of the tax type issues that you can run into with tax sales um, and, and some of the other, uh, you know, uh, forced sale related issues that have occurred, um, again, under the states that have adopted the Uniform Act. Um, it's more of a challenge because that Uniform Act puts in... Um, a right of first refusal, in essence, for the other the other heirs to be able to, to buy at fair market value the, the the interest, but in states like North Carolina that don't have it adopted yet, um, someone you know is a speculator can still come along and, and and pick off an interest from a cousin in New York, and 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 uh, compel its um, you know through a partition action. So, um, those are, I don't know if, uh, Diana, you may have some additional thoughts on that. No, I, I agree. I think local land trusts are incredible community resources. Yeah. Um, they have their ear to the ground about challenges or threats to the area, um, about changes in tax code. Um, and their role is really, whether they're easements on the property or not, is really about the conservation of the land in that area. And so I really do think think that they are there as a resource for that community. And, and, and I would add, you know, Christoph, just to, to, to Diana's point on terms of land trust, I think one of the, one of the, the, the values of the, the Alliance is in some of the work um, that Diana and, and others with the Alliance are doing is that th this is information that, um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to pass along to, you know, the over thousand member land trusts of the Alliance so that a lot of this type of material uh, is, you know, is, is disseminated down to local levels um, because there might be, you know, local land trusts um, who, who aren't aware of some of these issues. I mean, you know, one of the common responses I've heard is, well, we don't have heirs property in New York um, and yet New York passed the Uniform Act because there is heirs property. There's heirs property anywhere. I mean, you know, it doesn't take, <laughs> you know, um, you, you can just own own a piece of land with a sibling and that's heirs property, uh, depending on the way you own it, um, it, it you know. So, um, but I, th I think, I think the, you know, that's, that, that can prove to be a, a very valuable resource, um, you know, as, as, as this issue gains more, more and more attention. And uh, before we head out, can you all, let us know how to reach your organization, how to reach y'all, um, the best way to get information. Because um, I want to, I want to make sure that folks have some actionable items like they can leave with, where they know like they have questions, they can look up certain groups or individuals or institutions, um, and and hopefully take a lot of this information we've shared and be able to do something with it that that's useful. 
Sure, I, I am happy to talk about this issue and more. Uh, you can always reach me through the Land Trust Alliance. Uh, just Google Land Trust Alliance, it's lta.org. Again, I'm Diana Norris. I think there are a lot of amazing groups out there that um, who have really taken the lead on this issue and I continue to learn from them and I wanna make sure that they really get the, um, the applause that they deserve in this outgoing issue, um, the Black Family Land Trust and certainly the Center for Heirs Property Preservation um, and the groups that have been involved. So I would say definitely check out those, um, those organizations. I'd also say that the US Department of Agriculture has a quite a bit of information on heirs property and on the programs that they are currently developing and working on too. So certainly looking up the USDA and heirs property simple Google search, but definitely Diana Norris at the Land Trust Alliance. I'd be happy to talk to anyone about this issue. Awesome. Yeah. And so uh, for me, uh, it's, it's, it's my role uh, with the, both the Alliance and the center is, is board. It's a little more of a challenge, but, but certainly if, if folks uh, reached out to you and wanted to, to, to interact with me, I'm more than willing because I, I, I love talking about the issue and, um, you know, I would add, of course, in, in addition to uh, the, the organizations that uh, Diana mentioned in North Carolina is the Land, Land Loss Prevention Project in Durham. Um, and they are um, involved in a lot of these, uh, these issues um, in, in the Triangle area of North Carolina. Um, and in addition, there's the um, American Forest Foundation. They, they actually have the uh, Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention um, Project. Um, and that's uh, Mavis Gregg uh, is involved with that. And the center is actually the South Carolina location for the SFLR, as it's called, program. Uh, the, Black, uh, the Black Family Land Trust is the Virginia uh, location for it. And uh, actually, the Roanoke Electric Cooperative in North Carolina is the program for it. But it actually uh, stretches all the way over to Texas. Uh, so the, the AFF's um, Sustainable Forestry and African American Land retention uh, program goes from Virginia to Texas. And so there are sites in each, uh, each of those states. I think it's up to eight now. Um, and as I said, the Center uh, for Heirs Property is the South Carolina one, Land Loss Prevention uh, 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 Project is the North Carolina one, and the Black Family Land Trust is Virginia one. Those are all wealths of, of information. Uh, the Georgia Heirs Property Law Center, I believe is the one in Georgia. So, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of material out there and, and whatever uh, certainly we can do, uh, you know, to help, um, we, we certainly will. The, the variety of, of levels of this and that like each municipality has kind of different code, each state has different code. Um, so I would encourage people to check out the organizations that are, I, I guess, local or, or germane to their geographic area. Uh, a question that's a bit more like personal for, for you all. When I started speaking to folks about collective land ownership, especially attorneys, like when I, when I spoke to regular friends, they were like, yeah, groups of folks had communes back however long ago. People in different cultures have uh, owned land collectively for thousands of years. When I, every time I spoke to an attorney and said, hey, a group of my artist friends and people that are in relationships want to buy land, the first thing they say is do not buy land with multiple people. Have as few people involved in the ownership as possible. And then I find out about real estate investment trusts where you have to have a hundred people involved. Or I find out about, you know, these uh, collective ownership organizations. And then I find out about land trusts where it may be five different entities that are involved that are in multiple countries, you know, what have you. Why are people so discouraged from collective ownership, but then you see collective ownership happening? I can take a quick stab, which is, I think, from an attorney standpoint, it's, you know, because you see the issues of tenants in common, you know, and, and partition actions and how, what it can look like when it goes bad. Um, what I would say is there are ways, for example, setting up, maybe not a, in, in the context you mentioned, a family trust, but you could certainly set up an LLC where it makes it much easier. You can define the rights of each, uh, each party who owns an interest in that land. Um, you know, you can, you can set up all the governance of how you want that to run. And, and it doesn't require, for example, 100% of the owners to have to agree to everything because that's where some of the disputes and personality differences can come into play. If you own it, you know, as, as tenants in common, you have to have that unanimous consent. And so all it takes is one dispute 
for one person to, to um, fall out of favor with another and you, and you lose your ability to, to get that 100% if, if you need decisions made related to the land. So, you know, for example, if you set it up under an LLC, you might be able to have that it's a 75% vote, um, you know. So if you've had some who, you know, who, who are on, on the outs, for example, you know, you, you can still run uh, the land, so to speak, uh, what needs to be done, the business of the land or, or whatever, um, but, but not with quite the, the higher, higher threshold of, of a tenant in common. Yeah, I'll just uh, chip, chime in on that one that, as Chris mentioned, we tend to um, clean up at the afterwards when things don't go necessarily the way you might have intended them to. So I would just say that there are a lot of creative tools out there. Um, the legal prof profession is, uh, it takes time to change, but there are creative tools, getting it set up correctly on the front end and documenting all of it um, will save you at the end. And so as Chris said, the documentation and the right entity to allow that communal ownership is possible, but just doing it correctly and in a way that the law recognizes uh, will help you enormously. Is possibly are one of the, is one of the reasons that uh, individuals are discouraged because the amount of legal work and the costs associated to do it properly and that it most likely won't be done properly. Because when you look at these huge developing, development companies, when they engage in certain projects, it's multiple companies involved. There might be more than five, seven different owners or what have you. Again, um, is it just that they have the resources to make sure it's structured properly or um, what do you think the difference is? Like at, after a certain point, individuals don't have the capital to do certain things. And it, it, it is groups of people that work in concert as corporations. But then why, when, you know, my friends are trying to do that and to possibly build some type of wealth, are we discouraged? I, I think, I think it's the transaction cost <clears throat> is, is an element, right? I think there, you know, there aren't as many attorneys you know, again, I think when we're talking about the tenants in common and other forms of ownership uh, of land, you know, it, it's glossed over in law school. You know, I mean, and really, if you're a practitioner um, in, involved in, in real estate, um, it's, it's just not the type of, of, of ownership that you typically see. It's, it's, you know, I mean, and that's why I think there's such a, a, an education component involved uh, with the heirs property discussion because it's just making people aware this isn't, this isn't a legal theory out there. This is, this is the real world. You know, it's just, you don't, you, you've not interacted with it to know it exists or, or, or whatever. And so, um, but I think the transaction costs can be an impediment, you know, to many, particularly um, for, for individuals or, or families uh, or, or, or groups who might be um, land rich, but cash poor, you know, uh, because again, you can't access a lot of the, 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 the programs that could help, you know, developers often set up, for example, multiple entities uh, for tax and other purposes, tax liability, other purposes. They're setting, you know, for example, a development up under one entity that, that goes maybe to another entity that might go to a real estate trust or to their main headquarter, you know, their main corporate entity. You see that all the time as, as, as tax and, and, um, and corporate planning. Okay. Okay. What I would just say, though, is that the upfront costs to have a tenants in common agreement or a family trust or an LLC created um, is well worth the cost upfront because the back end when there might be trouble or you actually lose the property in the end, it, the upfront costs outweigh what could happen later on. Yeah, we were advised if we were going to purchase um, property that we weren't living on and that would have any commercial purpose to do so under uh, LLC and remove our liability. And the person was like, you're going to have to start a company for every plot of land you purchase. And I was like, wait, so every time we want to buy something, we're going to have to spend thousands of dollars to, to then go spend tens of thousands, if not more thousands of dollars. And they were like, yeah. And, and like totally nonchalant, like, of course. And, and you'll end up with 10 different companies and they all manage different property because you don't want someone to sue you and be able to take all 10 of your properties that are under your one name. You want to have 10 different entities that exist in isolation. 
Um, and I was like, wow, this, this, there's a whole world out here. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's a litigious yes. world. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's Sorry. litigious. And, and unfortunately, attorneys, you know, we, we're, we're trying to think of what happens, you know, if it goes, if it goes uh, badly, if, it, if, it, if right. it goes wrong, you know, on the back end. You know, it's not everybody entering into something is generally uh, positive and happy when they're entering into, uh, you know, uh, you know, buying land or whatever, but it's the years down the line, you know, if there's a disagreement and what happens, that's the eventuality that, that you'll hear uh, individuals wanting to plan for and talk about. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming on. Um, again, this has been Just For My People. Would you all like to give your brief outros and then we'll say goodbye. Just thank you so much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed talking to both both of you. And again, I'm available if I can help in any way. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, th thanks for the privilege of, of, of talking about this. Uh, as folks know, it's, it's something that, that I can probably talk about too, uh, too, too much sometimes to, to some people, but um, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share the time with both of you and uh, look forward to uh, future discussions and, and uh, you, you know, and continuing the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we had spoken before where I mentioned I grew up in the D.C. area, so shout out to the, the DMV area. And I actually suspend every summer down uh, in North Carolina along Tobacco Row. A friend of the family had a farm and I'd go out and I learned don't name the goat because it might not be there the next year. Don't <laughs> name the crabs, the animals aren't pets. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I want to thank you all. And again, this has been Just For My People. My name is Chris Carr and we are signing off. Thank you, Chris.